Welcome. Thank you for being up bright and early and ready to go. Uh, we're off. We have another full day of activities planned for you. Uh, hopefully, you've had some a uh, good chance last night to talk and get to know one another and uh, talk about what's happening. So if you could silence your phone so you're not that guy. Uh, so we want to we want to keep it quiet if we could today and. We all will get calls, we all will have to step out, so just try to be as subtle as you can. I appreciate that. Uh, we all know that we lost a giant in the defense sector uh, this week, so I think it's appropriate that we start today, if you just join me for a moment of silence, in memory of Senator John McCain. Thank you. As I mentioned last night, this event couldn't be possible and wouldn't be possible without the support of our sponsors, and everybody should have gotten a program book. You'll see our platinum sponsors, our gold sponsors, and the other levels of sponsorship throughout the program book. Please take a minute to thank those sponsors as you come across them today and over the next couple of days. Really appreciate their resources and their dedication to the organization. Also, throughout the year, the Senedia organization works hard. We, we have events throughout the year of, of various size and various topics as we go through. And those events as well wouldn't be possible without the support and the dedication of our board of directors. And also on the first page of the program book is a list of all of our board of directors, the companies they work for. And again, they give up a lot of time, some of their resources to attend these functions, to organize them, and to support them. So I want to thank you to the sponsor and companies of our board members and all of our board members and for your help. Thank you for everything you do all year long for us. Uh, a lot of you know Defense Innovation Days and you know Senedia from Defense Innovation Days, but you might not know our, our path and where we've been a little bit. So I'm just going to take a minute and talk about Senedia, the Southeastern New England Defense Industry Alliance, a name only an engineer could have come up with. Uh, but it is what it is at this point. So Senedia was born in 2002 to help organize this region for the 2005 BRAC. It was put together with the local Newport Chamber of Commerce, the Commerce uh, Rhode Island industry leaders, some retirees from Newark and from Naval Station Newport, with some support down in the Groton, New London subbase area and bled into Massachusetts. That group came together, organized and strategized and worked through the BRAC process in 2005 to, with the intent of protecting the region. And it worked out so well, we actually grew the region. The Naval Station Newport grew some of the commands. The, the organization, through Senedia, through the congressional delegation, the process itself, really thrived and made the region a stronger place. So those leaders that were in place of Senedia at the time decided it was a good thing to keep it running. And, and at that point, there were probably 10 or 12 founding companies that made up the board. There was no staff. They worked hard, and they kept things organized and kept it running for quite a while. As the organization matured, we were able to get a couple of grants. So we were able to go from a part-time staff. Uh, you all know Molly McGee. She came on as a first as a board member, then agreed to come off the board to be a part-time executive director because we had a little seed funding. That led to more grants. That led to more staff. That led to more work. And we built the organization up to where we are today, where we focus on workforce development and economic development in the defense sector in the southeastern New England region. We run uh, several internships. We've created two strategic organizations as partners to us at Senedia. The first, the Maritime Cyber Security Center. They focus primarily on cyber internships and cyber training for our workforce. They work some of the NIST standards that were coming through and helping our member companies understand what that means to them and how to ramp up and support each other in that process. We created the Undersea Technology Innovation Consortium. A lot of you all we have become members of UTIC already. We created UTIC knowing that there was an opportunity that Secretary Gertz talked about last night with the other transaction authority, or OTA, that Newark was uh, building, organizing, and letting last year. UTIC organized as a 501c3 nonprofit, competed for that OTA uh, authority, and won that competition. And now we've got another great contract vehicle out there that we can all work for in our support of Newark and the Warfighter and the other uh, entities that come through and will use that OTA. 
So it's just a little touch on some of the other things that Snedia does. We run lunch and learns, uh, tech talks as we refer to them, various topics that help our industry and our, our different companies grow as we refer to our, our competitors. You know, we all come together. Sometimes we're teaming and working together on something. Other times we're competing for it. End of the day, we all have relationships with each other, and it makes the whole place a, a stronger, more vibrant community. So thank you for all of that participation and what we do together. As I also mentioned last night, normally Senator Reid is here on Mondays to Monday night to kick off the event, uh, and Senator Whitehouse usually attends today. The Senate is in session, so they're not able to join us today, but both of them did stop by yesterday earlier in the day to shoot a quick message for us. And if we could roll the video from Senator Reid, please. Let me welcome you all to Senate and apologize. Uh, the Senate is in session, uh, but also we are preparing to honor the legacy of Senator John McCain, one of the great Americans, someone who I serve with, and someone who's done so much for the men and women of the armed forces and so much for the defense industry, particularly here in Rhode Island. Uh, Senedia is an extraordinarily important part of our defense industry. Your efforts to develop new systems for the protection of our forces, uh, your efforts to collaborate, to build up employment and opportunities here in Rhode Island is something that I admire immensely. Uh, we are in a situation where we've passed a bipartisan National Defense Authorization Act suitably entitled the John McCain National Defense Authorization Act. We also are on our way to passing a budget this year on a bipartisan basis. Uh, so we're in good shape today, but the future, once again, we have to confront sequestration. Once again, we have to come up early next year with a plan that will allow us to invest in our national security, but continue to invest in our education, in our opportunities for all of our citizens. And that's some of the hard work ahead. But in this year's uh, um, efforts, I was very, very pleased to be able to work closely with many here today to help Newark gain special authority for expedited work projects. Uh, that's going to be uh, extraordinarily important as Newark is the cutting edge of our national security. Uh, undersea domain is one that we dominate today and with your efforts we will continue to dominate. Uh, and it's something vitally important to our national security. So let me once again thank you all for what you do every day and the reason you do it. It's not simply for making the bottom line look attractive. It's more fundamental. It's making sure that the men and women who go to sea to defend this nation have the very best equipment. They will not only survive, but they will prevail. And it's because of your effort. It goes way beyond uh, just a simple job for you. It's dedication to these men and women. For that, I profoundly thank you. Thank you. Great. And again, so the Senator really regrets not being here. This is uh, probably his favorite in-state event that he gets to, to participate in. As you all know, he spends a lot of time with us in, every year, so hopefully next year the schedule will work out better for us. I'd like to ask Molly McGee, to, our executive director, to come up and introduce the first speaker of the day. Thank you. Molly. Good morning, and I'd like to extend my welcome to all of you for coming to our fifth annual Defense in Innovation Days. Um, as we heard Secretary Gertz say last night, this is a unique opportunity to focus on the four thrusts he talked about. Staying focused on delivery, making sure we can pivot and be agile for the innovation, make sure we reduce cost, and make sure we have a trained workforce that can support the needs for the future. So again, thank you for all you do. It is my real pleasure to introduce our first speaker today. Steve Wallace is the Technical Director of the Development and Business System Center for the, De for the Defense Information Systems Agency, DISA. His responsibilities include the integration of commercial and government-owned technology to support DISA's advanced needs. And some of those include software-defined networking and identity assurance. He previously served as the director of cyber for DISA. He was the chief engineer for DISA's DOD email system, and he was also the chief of information for cyber. So Steve, thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. Clearly, I am not Vice Admiral Norton. 
Uh, I, we apologize that she couldn't be here. She had a family emergency. So you're, you're stuck with me this morning. But we're going to get through it. We're going to try to keep this uh, entertaining and informative as we go. So uh, if I can have the first slide, please. So as we, as we start to get into the slides, um, let me tell you a little bit about DISA and, and what we do. Uh, I've been at DISA for, for seven years, uh, seven and a half years. Uh, I've gotten to work on a variety of different programs. Uh, it's a, you know, we are a, a warfighter support agency. Uh, we work in the background, do a lot of the uh, uh, IT systems for the department. Uh, we run everything from the transport, uh, where we meet the internet, uh, all the way up through, we supply a lot of the security components to the endpoints uh, that sit within the, nope, that's not it, uh, within the Department of Defense. <laughs> so um, we get to touch a lot of things and, and see a lot of things. And, and the Undersecretary made some really interesting points yesterday. So one of the other hats that I wear, uh, while uh, I'm also the tech director for our development and business center, uh, we're standing up a consolidated innovation office, right? And, and everybody, innovation is that big buzzword these days. This, this industry, we love our, love our buzzwords. Innovation is just the latest one. Um, we're, we're standing up this innovation group uh, and, and one of the core tenets of doing that is delivery. Uh, it, there's a lot of folks in, in our world, um, not just in the DISA world, but the broad IT world, they like to play with things. They like to play with gadgets. They, you know, they enjoy the technology. And we can't chase every new technology that comes along. We have to find the applicable technologies and, and go after the, you know, the ones that are applicable to our mission, to the department's mission, and best support the, the warfighter uh, in general. So um, I'm trying to add some time here. Um, <laughs> I brought my dancing shoes, so so I can definitely. It, it won't be pretty, but I can I can. Um, so the other side, uh, I tell you what. Let's just go ahead and let's get into things. We don't need slides, right? Let's. Uh, does this thing pop out? All right, this thing pops out. Let's go ahead and let's let's talk about the the different sides of of DISA. Um, Admiral Norton, she wears two hats. Uh, she wears the DISA hat as well as the JFHQ Doden commander hat. So uh, Doden was stood up uh, about three years ago. Uh, and the idea, there we go. Uh, so uh, next slide, please. Uh, all right. So there's, um, she wears two hats. In one hat, she reports to the DOD CIO when she's the director of DISA. The other hat, she reports to US Cybercom when she's wearing her Doden hat. And the best way that I've heard it termed, uh, and, and I guess since we're, we're with a mainly Navy office, the Navy audience here, um, the DISA side builds the boat, the Doden side operates and defends the boat, right? So um, on the DISA side, uh, we conduct a variety of operations. We build a lot of the tools that are used from an IT perspective to defend the network. Uh, we supply a variety of enterprise services. Uh, we mentioned enterprise email earlier, uh, where we've got uh, about 1.8 million users on that system across the department. Uh, and then you have the Doden side of the house. They're the ones that are actively defending that network and, and providing the security around it. Doden's got about 150 people. Uh, DISA itself, about 1,000 people scattered about the about the world. Um, our FY19 budget at DISA was about $1.9 million, billion dollars, and while Doden's was uh, just shy of $50 million. Next slide. OK, so the leadership structure, uh, we talked about that re those reporting. You can see the leadership structure here on, on either side. Uh, there's a variety, there's a, there's a whole litany of folks underneath of these individuals at the top of the chain uh, that make day-to-day -day operations and delivery happen at DISA. So next slide. Who we support? Uh, so we support, uh, you know, all the military services, uh, all the combatant commands. Uh, there are the what we call fourth estate within the department. So the other DoD agencies as well as the field activities. Uh, we we have 
constant interaction with all of them. Uh, the executive branch, uh, DISA has an organization called WACA, the White House Communications Agency, uh, where we work very closely with the White House to provide, every time you see the president speak at a podium, uh, that is provided by WACA. Uh, so we work very closely with the White House in order to help them with their communications needs, and then as, uh, several other government agencies uh, across the uh, across the federal space. Next slide. Where we are, we're everywhere. Uh, we have nine data centers uh, across the uh, across the planet. Uh, most of them are CONUS based, but uh, we have a few that are in Europe as well as PAC. Um, we've got field offices uh, co-located with a lot of the combatant commands. Uh, we host somewhere in the order of about 2,500 applications within our data centers. Uh, some of them, we, it's simply a hosting agreement where the organization uh, manages those systems themselves and we just provide ping, power, and um, HVAC. Uh, then we also have uh, about 17,000 circuits. So DISA provides that backbone uh, for the Nippernet uh, as well as the Cipernet. Uh, we, we're providing that, that underlying transport uh, so that we can deliver out to the farthest points. Uh, next slide. All right, so let's talk about innovation. And there's a, we're gonna talk about the things on this slide as well as a few others. So. You know, we mentioned innovation is all about actually delivering things, right? We all want to play with toys, uh, but at the end of the day, we actually have to deliver something. So uh, we'll start up here at the at 12 o'clock with the electromagnetic spectrum. So DISA also has an office located in Annapolis, Maryland, called the uh, Joint Spectrum uh, Management Center. Uh, and what they do is they provide management of the spectrum for the department. Uh, but that's a pretty complicated job. There's a whole lot of spectrum and, and a whole lot of need for that spectrum. So there's a, a, this group is dedicated to, to how we help the department with that. They've got a couple of interesting things going on, uh, a couple of pilots that we're trying to get out there right now with respect to how we are visualizing that spectrum and how it's being deployed and, and used out there in the field. The next is software-defined networks. And if there ever was a more loaded acronym in the alphabet, it would be SDN. Um, so when, when the, the notion of doing SDN first came up, uh, we, you know, the, a lot of the leadership came to us and said, well, you know, we need SDN, we need SDN. Okay, and so just go buy us some SDN and, and plug the box into the, into the data center and, and rainbows and puppy dogs will come out and uh, everything will be solved, right? All of our problems will be good. But, but the reality is, is everything's moving to, to a software driven environment, right? If you look in your car, your car 10 years ago, in that dash, that radio, it was a bunch of hard push buttons that had a singular function. If you were lucky, you could set some presets, you could do some you know, things like that. Now you look at a modern automobile and it's all just a simple LCD screen that the manufacturer can push a change. Tesla is a prime example of this. They can push a change and change the way that that dash works um, at a moment's notice, right? There's nothing physically hardware driven anymore, it can all be changed at a moment's notice. And that's what we're doing within the data centers now and, and really, you know, in this, we call it SDE, uh, mainly just software defined enterprise, because it's bigger than the networks. It's not just the networks. It's gotta go all the way down from the time that somebody has a good idea and they bring it to us to deploy to the time that we actually serve it up and then maintain it. It's all gotta be software driven. It can't be, there. we've gotta eliminate as many manual processes in there as we can. So um, we're in the process right now of rolling all of our data centers uh, over to a truly software-defined network itself. Uh, that'll be our first out of the gate, and then we're going to uh, roll probably sometime next uh, calendar year into a um, software-driven compute environment and, and better leveraging some of our cloud resources. So uh, we're pretty excited about the SDN, or SDE efforts within the agency. Uh, we've got a strategy. When we first started, there were about 13, we went around the agency and counted about 13 different efforts that claimed that they were doing SDN within the agency. Uh, because when the proclamation came out, hey, let's, let's do SDN, you know, a lot of people kind of went 
okay, I'm going to do SDN. I'm going to do good stuff. And they went into their areas and their pockets and they, they started doing it. So we had to ferret out those, collapse them down, get everybody in line, come up with a consolidated strategy and, and then start to move out. So we've done that and we're starting to deliver now. The next would be uh, gray networks. So gray core is a, is a really uh, fun, interesting concept, and a lot of these build upon one another. So gray core allows us to deliver classified uh, services further out towards the edge. And rather than having strictly dedicated transport and, and dedicated devices that only speak to that one classification, uh, it allows us to use, again, software and, and through cryptography, do that separation to deliver further towards the edge uh, um, you know, these classified networks. So uh, gray core is, is, is pretty interesting for us and we see that being one of our core competencies as we continue to evolve. Uh, the next, Mill Cloud 2. So uh, earlier this calendar year, I think it was early this calendar year, maybe late last calendar year, we delivered Mill Cloud or we awarded the contract for Mill Cloud 2. Uh, that contract went to CSRA. Uh, and it is a completely managed service. Uh, On-prem though, it sits in our Oklahoma City as well as our, um, uh, it also sits in our Montgomery data centers. Uh, and what it is, is it's, it's a completely uh, commercially managed cloud provider uh, that we are starting to move a lot of our applications to right now. This is eating its own dog food and in the process right now of moving many of our applications over to MailCloud 2. We're also working with a lot of the fourth estate partners to begin migrating their applications over. Dramatic call savings as opposed to our traditional compute platforms. Call savings even when compared to systems like AWS. So uh, it, it's, we're really excited about the way that that one is turning out. We're going to learn some lessons along the way. We're going to take some bumps and some bruises. Uh, but in the end, of the, we believe that it's worth it. And uh, again, helping us to deliver. The next, mobility. So mobility's you know, we, mobility has really just become another endpoint, right? We're, we've, we've had smartphones, uh, I guess, in, in a popular sense for over 10 years now. Um, Mobility is really just becoming another endpoint. But the question is that the devices have improved in terms of capability to this point um, where do you really need a desktop anymore? Can we get down to one compute device for the majority of employees? Can I walk into my office in the morning, drop my phone into a docking station, be presented with a full UI, and then start working from there? And, and we think that time is, it has occurred. I, I actually, my desktop failed me a couple of weeks ago. It was uh, my fault at the end of the day. But um, I was able to use my mobile device, plug it into a cradle, and operate do my job just as I would any other time. I mean, let's be frank. Most users are in a browser, they're in an email client, and they're in some form of office productivity software all day long. Most of that can be done from a mobile device. So now you take that and you pile that on top of Graycore. Can I ha now have a multi-level device that sits in my pocket that's with me everywhere that I go uh, and where I can get everything done, not just at the unclass level, but potentially also at the secret level. And those are, we're trying to use these things to build upon one another uh, and, and ultimately get some things out there. The next, uh, JRSS. So Joint Regional Security Stack, uh, it's been a fun one. Uh, we've learned a lot of lessons with JRSS. Uh, you know, if when I look back at it, I related a lot to what we learned with enterprise email when we rolled out enterprise email. JRSS is far more complicated than enterprise email was. Um, but we've learned a lot from JRSS and, and not just about how we onboard uh, the services as we bring them on to JRSS, but also how we provide the services. So we're looking at what are, what are the next generation, not even 2.0, but where are we trying to go with 3.0 with JRSS? And so, you know, looking at more of a software-driven environment, making it more adaptable, making it uh, easier for the operators to use uh, is our goal with, with the, the future of JRSS. So a couple of things that aren't on this chart that I wanted to touch on. Um, one that I'm, I'm really, really excited about it. We've been working on it for about two years and it's about to become real, um, was the concept of browser isolation. So 
the browser, the modern browser on the desktop is responsible in some way, shape, or form, they estimate, for about 70% of the intrusions into, a, in, into the network. Um, typically, the user gets a phishing link or you know, they hit a bad site and something's executed in the browser, a zero-day attack, a PDF, something like that. So we, we stepped back about two years ago and we said there's got to be another way. We can't continue to pile additional boxes into the network and think that this is a really good idea, right? Every box that we put in the network causes the user experience to spiral downward. Um, we're, we're really just chasing, it's a cat and mouse game, right? We're, we're constantly chasing that mouse and the mouse is constantly up in its game. Um, so we thought, well, what can we do with respect to that browser to change that dynamic? And so what we did is uh, we started to look at how we could move that browser off of the desktop. Let's get it off the desktop. Let's get it out of the network. Let's put it on the outside. Uh, so what we're, the idea behind our browser isolation work is that put the browser out in the commercially hosted data center and then provide a video representation of that browsing activity back to that user. Nine times out of 10, you can't tell the difference. It is imperceivable to see the difference between that and a browser that's located on the workstation. So the other side to it is, is we, we can uh, also reduce the bandwidth in the network. So we can better deliver the services to those uh, you know, DIL type of environments. Um, so we're, we released an RFI to industry uh, back in June. Uh, we got 45 responses. We were blown away by the number of responses that we got. We did not expect that. I uh, got 45 responses, which made us even more excited. Um, and we're in the process now of, of tightening up our, our business case and so that we can turn out uh, an RFI or, or something else uh, in the very near future. So we're, we're really excited about the way that that can change the dynamic of how we're defending the Doden. Um, the next one is, is machine learning and AI. And, and th that falls in the same kind of category as SDN. It, it's not a singular technology that we can just go out and buy and put into the data center and, and kind of hope for the best. Uh, it's really taking it uh, from a methodology type of perspective and considering how it applies to different things. There's not just one version or one flavor of machine learning. You've, you know, you've got supervised, unsupervised, a variety of models behind that. Um, and so there's there's uh, you know a lot of lot of things that um, uh, we have to learn about, and we look forward to partnering with industry. It, it's it takes a different type of talent. It, it takes a lot of talent in order to deploy ML and AI, but we think that we can use it in a lot of respects to help tamp down some of the false positives that we see in our network alerts and and that type of thing. Um, we can find we can ferret out patterns that, that humans typically aren't doing. Um, typically aren't able to do. Uh, but what I'd ask from industry is as they approach us with, you know, I've got the greatest, latest and greatest ML and AI, you know, explain to us why. Don't, don't just tell us, uh, you know, you've got the latest buzzword. You know, give us the why. Tell us how it applies to our mission and, and, and how it can actually benefit. There's, um, and, and, and please don't make it up as we go. We, we've got to, uh, it's, it's got to be rock solid as, as we start to look at it. Um, the last one that I wanted to talk about is uh, assured identity. Um, can you flip the next slide? Is that on the next slide? No, okay, back up one, please. We'll stay with this. So assured identity, uh, we've, gotten, we've gotten some press for that. Uh, about two years ago, Mr. Halverson, who was the DOD CIO, stood up at, at, at some event and said that we were getting rid of the common access card in two years. And that came as a great surprise to many of us who actually work on the common access card and the, and the crypto behind the common access card, right? So, so he made this proclamation, um, but it wasn't completely unfounded. Uh, we realized the fact that, you know, as we're moving, again, you know, speaking about mobility, to these computing devices, there is no CAC slot or smart card slot on this thing anywhere. Some vendors will do cases and that kind of thing, but those cases don't last. They, you know, they last one generation of the device, and then the, the manufacturer inevitably changes the form factor and it's, it all goes to pot. Uh, I'm sure many of you in this room, I, I can attest, um, have BlackBerry sleds probably still tucked away in a drawer that haven't seen the light of day since about 2005. Um, 
So, so those types of things really don't work. So we, we stepped back and we said, okay, what are our challenges with authentication? The first being authentication tends to, tends to be point in time. I, I plug that CAC in, I type in my PIN number, the system authenticates me or the application authenticates me and away I go. And it's either time-based where it'll time out or it's in there for as long as that common access card's in there. So we wanted to make it continuous. We wanted w what we dubbed continuous multi-factor authentication. We wanted CMFA. And so that was, that was one of the tenets. The other one was um, that it, it, it has to start with mobile, but then we have to be able to work it down into the wearable technology. So we're, we're starting with the mobile devices, but we're working our way. The goal is, is to get to the point where it's potentially a wearable that consumes, that costs less money, that consumes very little power and, and is um, um, more useful. So we've got two programs working in the assured identity realm right now. Um, the first, we awarded a contract about this time last year uh, to a vendor, a hardware chipset manufacturer. And what they're doing is they are uh, integrating a lot of these continuously multi-factor authentication ideas into the hardware chipset. So a low pi power island that sits on that chipset and then takes input from things like the gyroscope, the accelerometer, uh, the uh, GPS antenna, doesn't use the operating system, that was one of our core tenants, was we didn't want to just get a piece of software that would load on top of the operating system and then you've got to deal with the security of that OS. We wanted something that was low, way down in the stack. Uh, and then finally, it had to be commercially available. We don't want another um, SMEP head. Uh, we certainly don't want another clipper chip, if anybody actually remembers the, the clipper chip from back in the 80s. Uh, we don't want any of that. We want it to be commercially viable. We want to change the way that not just the department does identity and, and authentication. We want it to be a, uh, a commercially viable technology. So the vendors delivered us the first five prototype devices. Uh, they owe us another 45. Uh, we'll receive those uh, later here in the calendar year. Originally, we had planned to be done with with our testing uh, by the end of this calendar year, but that's gonna, that's gonna, it looks like we're gonna go into the early part of next calendar year. What would a government program be without some sort of slippage, right? So uh, we're in the process of, of doing that. Pretty excited about that. Uh, the idea is that you would be able to use that device to authenticate to a PC uh, while we still have PCs, but it really becomes your, uh, your computing device um, at the end of the day. And, and it's not just using the sensors, it's also the work behind generating a risk score and using, creating that fusion of those, the input of those different sensors, figuring out which one is more important than the others and how to drive a risk score associated with that user and their activities. So next slide. So DISA does a lot of work with small business. Uh, we've uh, last year alone, we awarded somewhere in the order of 1.7 billion in contracts to small businesses. Uh, we have our SETI program, which is the System Engineering and Technology Innovation contract. It's a large vehicle. Uh, we've awarded the unrestricted pool. That's a larger company pool. Uh, we expect the restricted pool, which is the small business pool, to be awarded sometime in the near future. Uh, really looking forward to that. But we we think that's really going to give us a, even more opportunity to work with small business and bring some other ideas to the table that you know maybe we're not looking at right now. Uh, Carlin Capinos, she was uh, recently named the director of that group. Uh, I w I've worked with Carlin in the past. Uh, she is a wonderful lady. Uh, I'm really, she, she really wants to work outside of, of the norm and wants to do some interesting things. So I think she'll do some really awesome stuff with that uh, small business office. So really looking forward to her taking that over. Uh, next slide. All right, so this is again back kind of an overview slide of uh, kind of what we do to, to close things out. But you know, there's a the variety of statistics on this slide. I'm not gonna bore you with every single one of them. Um, but we see about, you know, just over a billion events per month that we're dealing with. And that's where a lot of this SDN and the automation behind it has got to come into play. That ML, the, you know, the machine learning or the, the, the AI has got to come into play. Um, we have some automation in that area now, but we've really got to get better uh, you know, anticipating the fact that, that our enemies are going to be using 
machine learning and AI themselves. Uh, we can't have a human on the other end of that loop uh, expecting to, to catch and deal with you know, everything that's going to come our way. We've got to have strong algorithms and, and strong machine learning behind that. Um, we deal with about 420 unique phishing attacks per year. Uh, we flow somewhere in the order of into into Nippernet alone. Um, I think it's I think it's about 40 million messages a day, uh, and then we filter out about 80 percent of that. So DISA runs uh, what we call EEMSG, the the message gateway that sits out at the very front of Nippernet that protects. Uh, many of the, the systems behind, many of the email systems behind. So, so we filter about 80%. That's, that's industry standard uh, of the messages um, you know, before they get back there. Uh, each month we make about 440 million in contract obligations. Um, we, we bring about 8,300 uh, users on to JRSS uh, each month. Uh, we are uh, looking to scale that up and get that to be a little bit more rapid, but again, we're working through some of the growing pains associated with it. Um, so with that, uh, I think next slide. All right, that was really all that we had from uh, you know our overview as well as what we're doing with innovation. Uh, wanted to open it up for a few minutes if there's any questions or you know I'll try to again do my best dancing. Ah, uh, quiet audience this morning. Ah. Sir, the, uh, one of the big concerns in small business is um, the security of our IT infrastructures, meeting our cybersecurity requirements. Um, tremendous cost for small business at a time we're asked to reduce cost. Is there anything, when we talk about partnering with small business, is there anything that DISA is doing to help small business in this area? I am not aware of anything off the top of my head, but what we can do is, is um, I've got Ms. Lyles Quinn down here from our PAO office. We can take that back, and, and I'm happy to ask Carlin that question. And uh, but I don't know anything off the top of my head, and I, I wouldn't want to lead you astray. So we'll get you an answer to that. Any other? Yes, sir. Good morning. Thank you very much. Just try to connect. You, you said a large part um, or a major line of effort is is protecting your infrastructure, protecting the networks and the enterprise. And we're, many of us are working in undersea. Can you talk about uh, the, the vulnerabilities of the, the, the big DESA enterprise to undersea infrastructure? Sure, so um, uh, we are, I mean we are, there, there are, without getting into too many details in this room, uh, we have had issues in the past where there have been you know, cuts for whatever reason, and, and we've had to deal with that. We've, we feel that we've built the network uh, to be resilient enough that you know, we can take a few hits before we really start to experience. We do have those satellite shots, and if we need to, we can start to move traffic and, and balance traffic across some of the satellite shots. Obviously, that's not optimal. That's not what we want to do generally. Uh, but it is definitely something that comes into play with respect to, you know, given places around the world uh, and how we uh, uh, egress from those spots with respect to the network. So it is something that weighs on our, uh, specifically our transport engineers as we're laying out our networks, yes. Yes, sir. Your work with uh, browser integration really sounds, uh, or should I say isolation, really sounds interesting. Is that something that you share with industry? Yes, so, so we did our RFI. Um, uh, you know where we we went out. It went out on Fed Biz Ops, uh, where we went and shared, uh, you know, our requirements for what we were thinking at the time. That was that was in June. Um, so and, and when we go out now that we've gotten those responses, we're using it to, to enhance our BCA and basically check our homework, if you will. Uh, and so the goal is is to go out. I, it. We're working through the acquisition strategy, so I don't, I, I can't tell you exactly how it's going to go out. But that is something that we anticipate will go out to industry, and uh, you know we look forward to working with industry to, to deal with that problem. But um, yes, that's one I'm really excited about because it is, it's that different. It's, it's not the norm. Um, so yes, we will be working with industry on that one very closely. 
Did that answer your question? I was hoping you'd share the results. <laughs> share the results of the RFI? Well, no, the, the how you're going to do that, how it's going to be. You know, we, would, we would all like to do that. Sure. Oh, okay. So, sure. I, I mean, I yeah, it's one of my babies, so I, I can get into deep, deep. I can go get back up to my room and get all kinds of PowerPoints that we can dive into. <laughs> um, give me a whiteboard and we'll really go to town. Um, so yeah, I mean, the idea is that there, there's basically, it looks like an in industry, there's two approaches to the problem, okay? So there's some companies that solve it by basically um, spinning up some VMs, having Firefox or Chrome or whatever on, the, on those VMs, and then presenting that through a video stream, an H.264 video stream, back to the end user. Um, and that generally works pretty well. A lot of the, a lot of the, where are the NAVC folks? I saw some NAVC folks, okay. So we actually, NAVC was part of our pilot, and we piloted that technology specifically. Uh, we worked with NAVC, it, it was earlier this calendar year when we did that. Um, so, so that's one way. The, the challenge there is when you get into the DIL environments that that video stream tends to break down, right? Think VDI or think any sort of you know video stream. When you start to get latent communications or packet loss or anything like that, it starts to block. Bad things start to happen. Users click and things don't happen. Um, another approach that we've seen in industry, um, we call it basically the proxy approach. And and so what they do is they place a proxy in the network, um, and then they they. The user, you can either load a proxy pack or you can do some creative routing on the network. And what will happen is, is the user uses their traditional browser. The other way they have to use a, you know, a very specific application. But they can use a traditional modern browser um, and point at that proxy. And that proxy actually does the browsing and the rewriting for them. And so from a user's perspective, I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, in that, if you go to CNN.com, don't worry about your political leanings. Let's just talk about CNN.com for a moment. Um, you go to CNN.com and you'll see that it brings back about 7,000 lines of code that are executed on your endpoint. Style sheets, um, JavaScript, all kinds of fun stuff that are coming. And that's a pretty generic site, right? That, that's a pretty mainstream site. Um, there's also a browser plugin called Disconnect that I love to use. Disconnect is a lot of fun. Um, and, and the real irony in this one is CNN did an article when we did our browser isolation RFI. And we loaded the Disconnect plugin, and I noticed that Disconnect shows that my browser, when I go to that article, it'll show you, it'll give you a map, a nice visualization of all the things that your browser is talking to when you go to that website. When I went to that website for our browser isolation work, it showed that my browser talked to 70 other sites. 70. Some are innocent. Some are content delivery networks, right? To, you know, just delivering graphics to, to your machine. Um, some of them are advertising Google Analytics, that type of thing. Um, but if you really think about it, whether it, from the corporate perspective or from the DOD perspective, data is key these days, right? Data is king. And they're taking that data that, that these analytics engines, and they're building profiles about you. That's why when you look at something on Amazon and then suddenly you search for something in Google, magically they know exactly what you just looked at and they're offering you advertisements for it. So um, you can bet that there are folks building profiles about your folks either in the corporate world or in the government world and we don't even know who, from the data broker's perspective, who they're selling it to. So Disconnect's pretty interesting because it'll show you what's going on there. So with the proxy approach, um, we might want to clear the whole morning because I could really go. Um, <laughs> With the proxy approach, that, that, one's, that one's interesting because we can do it without the user really even knowing it. Um, we can, what it does is the user talks to that proxy and then that proxy spins up some virtual machines and it goes out and it talks to these sites. And if you use a tool like Disconnect and you look at it before or after, um, you can see that um, when we looked at it, like I mentioned, that article on CNN, 70 odd connections to, to other sites. Um, when I looked at it after the fact, after we went through the proxy two, one was to a machine in our lab, the domain controller in our lab, and then the other one was to the proxy server, right? So I'm now only talking to two. I'm now also dramatically cutting down on the amount of garbage that's brought back to my machine. I think it was uh, 15 lines of code, if you view the source on the page, 
15 lines of code that were delivered back to that endpoint then. And so you're dramatically cutting back on the third party cookies, the you know potential for malware, all those kinds of things, all of that tracking, we just pushed out to the edge. We took it off of our network and got it out of there. Um, so both of them are viable approaches. They, they both have their ups and their downs. That's kind of what we're seeing from industry in terms of their offering. Um, the proxy-based approach is also nice because, again, your users don't need to know anything just happened. Uh, we can do it in the background. We can make a little line show up that tells them. We can send them to this site. Uh, for certain sites and not for others, we can do a variety of different things to configure it uh, to better deliver to them. But in my opinion, the, the best security is the kind that your users never notice. Because if they notice it, we probably just made it hard. And if we made it hard, they're probably going to try and find any way that they can to get around us to get their jobs done because that's what they'll do at the end of the day. So any type of thing that we can do to make that completely, you know, um, absent of their knowledge, uh, I, it plays to our benefit. Did that better answer your question? Yes, it did. Awesome. All right, any other questions? I just bored the living heck out of you guys. There you go, back there. Hi, uh, just a quick question. Uh, so the question was, is how are advertisers going to respond to that? Because we're potentially blocking advertisers. And that's fair. A lot of, lot of corporations as well as government organizations already strip advertisements from websites anyway because um, that's often a means of you know, malware delivery. So um, they, they may not look upon it favorably, uh, but at the end of the day, uh, I'm more worried about defending our networks than I am about, you know, whether you got the latest Charmin advertisement on whatever page, right? I mean, it, it, it's, it's just the fact that we spend uh, tens if not hundreds of millions of dollars a year on penetrations. And that's with all of the things that we already have in place uh, to defend the network. So, um, you know, it, it, we spend a tremendous amount of money to defend these networks. And a lot of it, frankly, is for morale and welfare browsing. But uh, that has been considered uh, a need uh, for the warfighter and, and for the folks in the department. So um, we will defend it and, and we will find new and creative ways to deliver. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, it also not crowd my page with that. I, I'm, I'm all in all pretty cool with that. Any uh, other questions? Ah. I don't know if you want to hear it, but it's a uh -oh. question. Uh, Brian McKeon, I appreciate your time here. Uh, one of the things I think is fascinating uh, is I think most of the industry partners here and government that are working here work on systems and programs that either through either contractually or through testing take a significant amount of time. It's it's probably a, probably one of the biggest concerns of this organization is is contracting time and test time uh, whether wherever that may be. Somehow with the, your organization you you have uh, set up an, an environment where you're probably changing the system on a hourly basis if not more rapidly. I didn't know if there was any way that your lessons learned on how that can happen, how you can have contractual methods that allow rapid changes as well as testing methods that people feel comfortable that probably the biggest concern area of our country is being you know, cyber attacks, yep. yet that's an area where we're changing on an hourly basis and I'm just hypothesizing. And if you could just uh, give us some con uh, points on that, that would be great. Thank you. Uh, I'd love to stand here and tell you that, uh, that we've got all of that solved. My nose would probably grow four inches if I told you that we had all of that solved. Um, but it's something that we're challenged with too and, and that we are working through. Uh, we've, we have made a lot of strides in that area. When I talk about the software defined work that we're doing, um, one of the things that we had to come out of there with that we were asked for and, and we were happy to deliver um, was the quality control plan because a lot of folks are resistant to automation and the change because they look at the what 
can happen if I do this. It's going to go horribly wrong. I'm going to make a change. It's going to go horribly wrong, and it's just going to domino, and, and bad things are going to happen. And, and you can look out there and, and see, you know, AWS has had its struggles um, with respect to, you know, outages caused by some of their automation. But the flip side to that is that they've also made tremendous strides in order to deliver capability quickly and rapidly with very few mistakes. And, and the ability to roll back from an automated change is also a whole lot easier. So the, the you know, there's a few things that we're doing on the contracting end. Um, we've done a, a fair amount of work at this point with OTAs. They are not the, you know, the end all be all solution to everything. Uh, we've done a few OTAs at, at this point, which help us to get the contracts awarded uh, more quickly. Now, once they're awarded, it really comes down to process procedure and, and frankly, the acceptance of some risk and getting the, the government folks, myself included, to be willing to accept some of that risk. But once we understand that the quality control processes are in place, that if something goes south, we can roll back from that. Um, but it is, it is something that we wrestle with uh, daily. Um, where we still have folks that are in the organization that want to do things. I want to manually balance this traffic from here to here and do this and that. Um, and it's it's working to evolve those people and, and get them trained. And, and really, you know, one of the things I, I meant to touch on with the SDN stuff um, was evolving folks, evolving our system and, and network admins from being command line junkies uh, to being truly software developers. They, it, the days of popping a command line open and, and banging on the keyboard for a little while to, to roll something out or to make a change are done. Uh, we won't, uh, we won't, uh, we can't get any further, um, we can't get any further doing it the manual way. So we, we've really got to automate. That, that's that got to be the key. All right, so thank you all. Uh, appreciate your time this morning. And uh, have a great rest of your conference. There you go. We would like to give you our commemorative coin. Oh, thank you. And thank you very much for your technical insights. I think many of us are going to be looking up Disconnect pretty soon and seeing what we can do with that. <laughs> that was not an endorsement. <laughs> that <know>. was. Uh... <laughs> and also, thank you for rearranging your schedule at the last minute to be here. We very much appreciate it. I wouldn't have missed Thanks. it. Thank you. Thank you.